This webinar is brought to you by the Morgan Franklin Fellowship Foundation. A little bit about us at MFF. Um, we are here and focus on financial literacy through a variety of different programs that we offer. Our flagship program is the Standards of Finan Financial Literacy course, which is available at our website, which is the morganfranklinfellowship.com that is open to individuals, or if you have a group that is interested in getting involved and in delivering some financial literacy education to your school, company, or organization, um, by all means, definitely check us out. We're really excited to have Paul as our presenter today. I personally have uh, been to a number of his uh, courses where he's taught them. They're pretty awesome and he's really engaging. Paul McLaughlin is the Home Ownership Program Director at Home Team in NeighborWork Southern New Hampshire. Paul has been the NeighborWork Southern New Hampshire Home Ownership Program Director since December of 2011. He manages Home Team's housing counseling program, providing one-on-one -on -one pre purchase foreclosure prevention, IDA, credit, non-foreclosure, post-purchase, and landlord counseling. He also conducts group education and home buyer education, financial capabilities, and foreclosure prevention. Paul also holds the Distinguished Certified Mortgage Professional designation, CMP, assuring prospective borrowers of his commitment to ethics and professionalism. Um, so he's been with uh, Home Team for over 10 years, and prior to that, he had over 20 years of experience in the banking industry. Um, before joining Home Team, he was an affordable housing loan originator for Merrimack County Savings, and prior to that, a loan production supervisor at Boston Federal Savings Bank. So as you can tell, Paul brings an immense amount of experience and knowledge on this topic. He has taught a variety of um, different programs and courses, and um, I won't go any further into this. I hope you really enjoyed this program with Paul. Um, I've definitely enjoyed all of my courses that I've taken with him. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Paul. Um, I am happy to partner with the folks here, my good friends at Morgan Franklin Fellowship. So just again, that's who I am, introduction to home buying. Um, and if I get this thing gonna work, let's see. There we go. Um, so home team, who we are is we are, we provide education and resources for New Hampshire residents with the information tools needed to make good financial decisions related to purchasing, renting, and maintaining your home. Um, we are a nonprofit. We are the education and counseling program of three different nonprofit affordable housing developers. As you can see here, um, NeighborWorks Southern New Hampshire, Catch Neighborhood Housing in Concord, and Lakes Region Community Developers up in Laconia. So we provide services from Nashua all the way up to the Lakes Region, from the Vermont border, all the way over to Western Rockingham County. Um, these are some of our great partners in the community. People ask how we can do things cheap and free. Um, this is why these great people all um, support our, our mission and also support us financially a little bit too. So we're always happy for that. Okay, let's go. So what role do we play? Um, there's yours truly teaching a home buyer class. Um, we, are, we are basically here to provide unbiased tools, resources, and education to New Hampshire residents. Um, unbiased is the most important term there. We have no skin in the game. Um, we're not making money if you buy a house or you don't buy a house. So I tell folks, anyone coming out of our program is 100% successful, even if they decide now's not the time. We don't want to see people get into something that they really can't afford. So some of our services, as Mike had mentioned, is our home buyer education and counseling, our financial literacy education and coaching. Um, we do a landlord and renter responsibilities training and post-purchase workshops and counseling. Um, so let's talk about, you know, why somebody would actually find it important to rent. So anyway, if you would be kind enough to put in your comments on what you think are some of the pros to renting? Why is it good to rent? Payment history, young without steady income, market is too high, little or no maintenance, flexibility if you plan to move soon. Beautiful. So we got most of them there. Um, your monthly costs are pretty steady. Um, no maintenance and repairs. Typically, you just call the landlord. I used to call my landlord to change my light bulbs. Um, so, you know, or to change the battery in the smoke detector. Uh, once you're a homeowner, you, you've got to do those things and everything else 
involved, such as um, maintaining a lawn, ma maintaining all the systems in the house. Um, you have more mobility and flexibility when you rent. So you can move, you can give a 30 day notice in most cases and move somewhere else where you might find a job or you might be getting married and you know whatever your life changes are, it's definitely more, much easier to move out of a rental than to move out of a home you own. Um, there might be bonus features, rent, you know, if you might have a pool house, you might have a tennis court, you might have extra parking, trash service, um, all those wonderful things that come with renting. Uh, they might even pay your utilities. So some of the cons on here, um, what's, what's bad about renting? So I will just go on to say, you have a limited control over your environment. Uh, the first time I moved into my own house, the very first thing I did was paint my bathroom bright pumpkin orange. Um, because I could, it was just nice to be able to paint your own walls. I will tell you, I'm not pumpkin orange anymore. I did get sick of it. Um, but it was just fun to be able to do your own thing. Put holes in the walls if you want. Um, again, another con is rising rents. Um, you never know when your landlord is going to raise your rent and it might be $5. It might be a hundred dollars. Uh, they, there is no limit that what they can, what they can do to you after, you know, a year lease and if they wanna change the rent amount. Um, you're not gonna build any equity. So you're not, it's not an investment. Um, you're not gonna be able to turn over that rental unit and make any money like you would do when you're selling a house. There's no tax benefits um, to renting. You, you can't write it off on your, on your tax returns. So again, why, let's go back to why home ownership now. So what are some of the pros of home ownership? Tax benefits. What are, paying towards something that's yours. Very good. Uh, who's that? Francesca. Uh, Britt, building equity. Yep, equity. Pumpkin bathrooms. <laughs> Thanks, Tori. Um, and I'm glad you guys seem to know about building equity. That's, that's always a good one. Um, you know, and I'll talk a little bit more about that here. Um, so again, homeownership is going to give you stability in your environment. You, nobody can really kick you out, of course, unless you don't pay. Um, pay your mortgage and maybe the bank will come after it, but there's stability for you and your family. You know you're part of a community and a neighborhood and hopefully there for a while. Um, control over the environment, the pumpkin bathroom, like I said, um, and basically anything else you want to do. Um, short of, you know, the one thing you can't control are your neighbors. Uh, so keep that in mind if you're planning on throwing house parties. Um, your stable housing costs. For the most part, if you have a fixed rate mortgage, that means your payment's going to stay the same for the life of having that loan. However, I do remind people that things like taxes and homeowners insurance do change over, over time, sometimes every year, but for the most part, you're gonna have a stable cost of what you know you have to pay every month. Again, building equity. So you buy that house that's, you know, you get a $200,000 house, you, you pay it down to $100,000, then you have $100,000 in equity. That's assuming the house is still worth 200. If over time you've been there 10 years and now the house is worth 300 and you've paid it down to 100, you're gonna have 200,000 in equity. And that basically means that's the money that's coming back to you when you sell. Um, there are tax benefits. You know, you, you can take your um, property taxes and your mortgage interest and write that off on your tax returns. So we get some cons. It's not all great. What do you think some of the cons are to home ownership? I'll ask you to put that in the comments. Oh, Francesca, that was a good one on um, getting an income property. You know, eventually you get a two family, you might be able to create some income through rents. So there's another pro as well. I'll have to add that one. Uh, mowing the lawn. You got it, Judy. Hate mowing the lawn. Um, and you are every weekend, instead of going out partying, you know, if you're an old man like me, you don't mind it. But if you're a young person, you may want to enjoy life and not spend every weekend mowing your lawn and, and doing maintenance, um, Tori. Uh, time, the length of time. So monthly costs, you're going to have maintenance costs. Um, people always tend to forget that. You have your mortgage expense, but you also have maintenance and utility costs. Chances are, if you're renting now, your, your electric, your, your gas, your you know, you're gonna have a water bill. Um, that's gonna be a lot more than when you were renting probably.
because you're heating and using more electricity in a larger space. So there is, you know, even though yes, people always say you can rent for what you can buy for what you can rent. Um, keep in mind that you're also going to have those additional costs that pile up. Uh, oh, franchise natural disasters. Yeah. I mean, what happens, you know, you better have good insurance um, in order to, you know, keep that house up. The maintenance and repairs. Uh, I always tell folks, you know, unless you're buying a brand new built house, um, how old is the roof? A roof life can be anywhere from 10 to 20 years. Um, and it can cost over $10,000 to replace a roof. That's pretty big and something you have to do. A uh, water heater breaks. Um, you need a new water heater. There's a few thousand dollars. Personally, I just, my garage door broke yesterday. I didn't even think I was gonna get in the office to do this. Um, and I called them, they came out $340 just to fix my garage door. So again, th there's those unexpected costs um, and the ongoing maintenance. Decreased mobility. So like we said, in a rent, you can, in a rental, you can give a month's notice usually and leave. Well, in a home, you have to sell that house. So it could take you longer depending on the type of real estate market we're in. Their houses may not be selling as fast. Um, so you could run into an issue where all of a sudden you can't sell that house and maybe you have to carry a second mortgage um, on another house because you're moving somewhere. So something to keep in mind that, you know, if you're, if you're thinking, I always tell folks, if you're gonna move in the next five years, you may wanna really consider um, whether or not you should buy. Um, this is fewer futures. Like I said, you might not have that pool, the tennis court, the, you know, the trash service. Um, when I moved into my first place, I always lived in rentals where somebody took the trash for me. Um, I had a dumpster outside, threw it in, went to work. Um, when I moved into my house in New Hampshire, I put the trash out on the front lawn and nobody took it. And after about three weeks of doing that um, and bringing it somewhere else to throw it out, I found out that the town doesn't offer trash service. Um, and I had to go to the dump or pay a service to come do it. So, you know, features like that, that you don't necessarily think about. Um, there's no guarantees in home ownership. You lose a job, um, you know, like I said, the market turns, which is what we went through about 10 years ago where all of a sudden somebody who had that $200,000 house, it was now worth 150,000 and they couldn't sell it because they owed too much on it. Um, so a lot of people, that's what we saw got foreclosed on at the time. So we, we, we talk about the 10 steps to home ownership. Um, I really say there's more like, you know, 110. So, but <laughs> just try to, to simplify it. I like to break it down into 10 easy to remember things. Uh, the first thing I would tell you is to prepare, okay, with education and counseling. Um, at the end of this, I will show you the link to our online home buyer education, um, and we're going to talk about the, our counseling service a little more in detail. Um, then you want to determine any obstacles and how much you can afford to spend. Um, so one of the, you know, what's getting in your way? Are there credit issues? Um, is it you haven't been at your job long enough? Typically a lender wants to see that you have a minimum credit score of 620. Um, they usually wanna see that um, you pay your bills on time and that you can afford that mortgage. So one of the key things we tell people is you know, to make practice payments. If you think you're gonna be going into a home that's gonna cost you $1,500 a month and you're currently spending $1,000 a month for rent, well, what you can do is practice. Put that extra $500 when you pay the rent for a thousand, put 500 in the savings account. If you can do that steadily for the next few months, then you know you can afford 1500. But at the end of the month, if you find yourself, you know, buying the pack of ramen noodles and, you know, not able to do anything without tapping that money, then maybe it's, you know, a little more than you actually can afford right now. I'm getting, then they go get pre-approved for mortgage. Um, so that's when you go talk to the mortgage lenders and they tell you, you know, what type of programs you can get and how much they can approve you for. So sometimes even though you might think you can afford something, um, the mortgage standards might say, no, you can't. Or sometimes I find people go and get a mortgage and they qualify for more than, it, than they thought they could afford. Um, not always the best deal to get into. Then decide what kind of home you want. So, you know, and you're gonna work with a realtor, a licensed realtor. I always tell people you should be working with known licensed professionals. Um, beware of online services that, are, you know, 
are nowhere near you or know nothing about your area. Um, and you know, some of them could be scams. But a realtor is going to help you decide, you know, do you want a two family? Do you want a single family? Do you want a condo? Do you want a townhouse? There's all different types of homes and neighborhoods out there. So typically before the realtor takes you out looking at, you know, and, and I will tell people, it's not like house hunters where you go look at three houses and you magically find the one of your dreams. Um, I've known people that have looked at 30, 40, 50 houses before they found the one they wanted and needed. So it's good to kind of sit down, determine your wants and needs. What I tell my couples that are buying together is that each person should sit down separately and put down a list of what their wants and needs are and then come back and compare. Um, you know, you might want a garage, you know, your partner doesn't care about a garage. Um, so different things like that, you wanna make sure you're on the same page. Um, and then you're gonna go out with that realtor shopping for that home, like I said, if you're lucky, hey, yeah, maybe on the third try, you find the dream home. Uh, you know, maybe you get some makeover folks come in and, you know, you're on TV, but it's usually not that simple. And then you're going to make an offer on the home. So the realtor, and that's why you want to work with the realtor, they're going to help you put that offer together. Um, I think a lot of folks get nervous that they're going to have to negotiate with the seller. Typically, you don't even have to meet or work with the seller or talk to them. Um, your realtor is going to work with their realtor to put that offer together. Um, your realtor is never going to tell you how much you should spend or how much you should pay, um, but they're going to be there to advise you on what you think you should pay and, and what would be um, probably an acceptable offer. Um, then by all means, you are going to get a professional home inspection. So one of the things about home ownership is there's a lot of programs that you can get in without with very little to no money. And I always remind people, but you're still gonna need money for certain things up front, such as a home inspection. Um, that could be several hundred dollars. So, but you definitely do, if somebody tells you not to get a home inspection, even more reason to get one. Um, you really wanna see that, how have somebody go in and look at the utilities, look at how the house has been maintained, what shape it's in, um, to give you an idea of, you know, some of the things you don't see, um, you know, behind the walls and up on the roof. Then you go back to your mortgage person. So even though you've already gotten that pre-approval, now that you have a home, you're gonna go back to your mortgage loan officer and actually apply for the mortgage on that house at that price. Um, and at that point, that's when they send it to what they call an underwriter, who's gonna actually sit down, determine if you meet the qualifications for whichever loan program. Then you're gonna to have to buy insurance and get maybe additional inspections. Maybe there's a well, maybe there's a septic system. Those would need to be inspected as well. And your lender is gonna require that you pay the first year of homeowner's insurance right up front. So that could be you know $1,000 um, right out of the gate. And then the last thing to do is you go to the closing um, with a nice you know closing agent. People always ask if they need an attorney, that's a personal choice. In the state of New Hampshire, you're not required to have an attorney do um, home closings, but you can certainly hire one on your own. However, our, all of our title companies usually do have attorneys on staff um, and pretty much know what they're doing. Most, most loans are pretty standard. So those are 10 of the 110 steps. So the four C's of lending, this is important. This is um, what lenders consider when deciding to approve you for a mortgage loan. It's an important question in order to be a successful homeowner, lenders wanna consider your entire financial picture. They're gonna look at your income, all sources, and the if it's reliable. They're gonna look at your current debts, your credit history. Um, they're gonna determine what we call ratios, basically what percentage of your monthly income can you afford to put towards a mortgage and can you afford to pay all your bills with? On a standard basis, Typically, you don't want your home payment to be more than a third of your monthly gross salary. They're going to look at your available assets to see if you have enough for down payment um, and closing costs. And finally, they're going to look at the property itself to make sure it's worth the purchase price. So let's explore some of these key questions that you should ask yourself and can share some pretty important facts you may not already know. So the first C we're going to talk about is capacity. Are you able to carry that debt load? Um, do you have a source of income to make the payments? 
do you have a lot of other outstanding debt? So, you, you know, your income might come from primary, secondary, and part-time jobs, as well as overtime bonuses. Um, you may be able to use other sources of income if you want to consider for payment, such as veterans benefits, disability, alimony, child support, rent and investment income, provided they can be verified as stable, reliable, and likely to continue for at least three years. So one of the things you want to, you know, be, be leery of or be aware of is most lenders want to see that you have a two-year employment history. Um, and again, I could get more specific into that, but you know, typically you want to see two years in the similar same profession. Um, so I always caution people, if you're somebody that's going from a full-time job with a full-time salary to something that's commission-based, a lender is going to want to see that you're two years of commissioned um, in order to qualify you. Same thing, if all of a sudden you go to be self-employed and you weren't before, they're going to want to see two years of that. So capacity is important. Can you carry that payment? And then credit, of course. So typically, like I said before, they want to see a minimum credit score of 620. The high credit score is the highest they go up to is 850. Um, that would be stellar. Having an over 800 credit score is excellent. Um, you're, you're probably going to get a lot of doors open for you. As you get down on the credit score, you're going to see your rates go higher. Um, you know, you might have to go with different, less, not as good a term as a typical mortgage. Um, so it is important to know what your credit is before you're out there looking and talking to anybody. That's why I always say the counseling is so important because we'll help review that credit with you. Um, and if it's an obstacle in your way, we'll work with you to, to improve it. Um, so just so you know, so on credit, it's credit is made up of basically, you know, you have a score and you have a history. I always tell folks at the onset, if you're not looking right now, just look at the history. Make sure you don't have lates on there. Most lenders are typically going back two years. So if you had a lot of delinquencies and charge offs three or four years ago, but the last two years you've been doing excellent, you might have a better chance. So just so you know how the credit score is made up, 35% of the score is based on your history. So are you paying your bills on time? Number one, um, that's the, one of the highest percentages of what makes up your credit score is paying bills on time. Um, typically on time means not later than 30 days. Um, your credit utilization. So how much have you utilized? Are you maxed out on everything? Are you, you know, so we always tell folks to have stellar credit, make sure any balances on your credit cards and things like that are less than 25% of your available credit. So easily example is you have a thousand dollar credit line and you typically don't want that balance to be more than $250. Um, you can even go up to 50%. That's not as bad either, but I can tell you the less, less un, the more under 50% it is, the better your credit's gonna be. Um, so your lender's gonna examine your payment habits, your credit history score, um, and again, what I tell people is I don't have it on here. Um, annualcreditreport.com is the site where that's set up for you to get one free credit report per year from each of the three credit reporting agencies. Uh, there's TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian. So if you happen to see a website that um, is, you know, has the word free in it, chances are it's not. Um, so, you know, don't go into those ones. Um, I do know there's other services out there that give you credit scores. They're not necessarily the same score that a lender would look at. So annualcreditreport.com is a great place to at least check your history. I tell people to do it even just for identity theft reasons. Um, this day and age, we're all prone to scams. Um, we're all getting, you know, I've known so many people that have gotten um, false unemployment claims in their name. So the first thing I tell them is, hey, let's look at your credit report, make sure nobody's touching it. Maybe we have to freeze it. So credit is very important, unfortunately, but that's what they use. Capital, do you have the funds for down payment and closing costs? Um, and those funds can come from a lot of places. Sometimes it might be a gift, um, but you have to demonstrate that you have that money. So one of the things a lender wants to see is that money is what we call seasoned. 
So if you all of a sudden have $10,000 to put towards a house and it shows up on your bank statement as deposited last week, they're gonna to wanna to see a paper record of where that, that came from. Um, so definitely, you know, you wanna make sure you have those records. If it's in there, most lenders are gonna look at your last two months bank statements. If it's been in there for that whole time, then they're not gonna question it. Um, but again, if it's that, and that's what we call seasoned. If you just put it in, just be prepared to explain it. If you sold a car, maybe, um, make sure you have a copy of that bill of sale. If you've got a gift from parents, you may need to show a cash check. Um, they need to show their bank statements too. So it's very important to look and see what you have. Even in a loan program where you're putting, you know, you're getting 100% financing where you have to put nothing down, you're still gonna need some money to pay, like I said, for that insurance, that appraisal, um, and that home inspection. So you're still gonna want some funds to start out with. Um, and then the last but not least is your collateral. Now oh, there's your house, right? Everyone's gonna live in this big castle. So the lender is gonna order a property appraisal. Property appraisal is different from an inspection. An inspection is just ma checking the maintenance, the, the systems of the house, um, wear and tear. The appraisal is really determining what the market value is on that house. What would a knowledgeable home buyer pay for this house compared to other properties that have sold within maybe a mile of the house within the last um, three to six months? And they're gonna compare that and come up with an actual value. Um, it's also not the same as the town's assessment. Towns give an assessed value on a property to determine your tax rate. And, and your tax amount. Um, and that's usually gonna be a little different than your appraisal too. Hopefully it's lower. Um, if your town is assessing your house lower than the appraised value, do not complain. Um, that is a good thing because that's what your taxes are made up of. Okay, this is just, this is my fun. Um, the four C's of debt. Any guesses? Oh, Tori, you got one. Okay, cost, collateral, credit, those are more the four C's of lending. But what I've seen in my history of doing this work um, in counseling and educating folks is, you know, and there's a lot of debt, um, but these seem to be the four biggest things that seem to kill people's finances. Um, and again, my opinion, I'm sure there's a lot more, but I, I figured we have the four C's of lending, let's do the four C's of debt. So as my good friend Tori says, Credit cards. Cars. I've seen people there, you know, that can't afford it, buying a brand new car, taking out a $600 a month car payment. In my personal opinion, not a wise move, um, but I do see folks also, they buy, they have a much older car that's eating up money on repairs. So cars are a big expense. Christmas, if you happen to celebrate, um, and maybe it's not Christmas, maybe it's Easter, maybe it's Halloween, maybe it's birthdays. Um, but I see that, you know, all of a sudden December hits and in January, everyone's struggling with their bills and they're paying those credit cards that they bought Christmas gifts with over the next six to 12 months and just staying in that cycle constantly. College is a good one, Brett. Thank you. That's a great one. Um, college is a good debt. I always tell folks, if, if you have a student loan, as long as it's paid on time, do not go delinquent on a student loan because that'll really hurt your credit. But college is what we consider a good debt, like a mortgage. It's an investment. You made an investment in your education and your future. Um, so it's not necessarily, a, I mean, it is a, a finance buster based on what people are paying for student loan payments um, these days. But again, not, not something that people are wasteful on either. And then last but not least, my favorite one that I will tell you our average client in counseling probably spends anywhere from $150 to $200 a month on is coffee. Nobody said coffee, $150 a month. I am a sinner, I will share. I already have a house um, and I try not to buy it too much, but you know, two of those a day, um, adds up over a month and depending on where you're going and what you're ordering, if you if you like a fancy latte, uh, you're going to spend a lot more. So beware of those things and any other debts you might be dealing with. 
So you have a lot of rights. Um, very important that you know that you are protected in buying a home um, in actually any credit transaction. Um, so the number one is the Fair Housing Act. And I'm not gonna go into all the dates and the specifics, but basically it just offers protection from discrimination based on race, color, national origin, religion, sex, familial status, or disability. In the state of New Hampshire, they've expanded this to include age, marital status, and sexual orientation. So those are things that might be different from one state to the next. Um, hopefully they're all the same. There's the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. Um, again, you can't be discriminated um, based on any of, any of those um, statuses to get credit. If you think you have been discriminated against, you should file a complaint. Um, so the, some of these websites, the first one is New Hampshire Legal Assistance. Um, they love working with fair housing issues. Um, and it's kind of the same thing as if you're renting too, um, if you know somebody won't rent to you. But it can be, you know, you could think that your realtor and lender are very nice and they may not mean to be discriminatory, but they just might say something. Um, you know, they have to be careful when they advertise. Um, I saw a bad ad, a realtor got in trouble once for saying, um, it was, you know, they, they said something about um, the house being great for an elderly person. Um, well, you know, that's, you're, you're, you're telling other people, no, you're telling families, no. So even if you just have that weird buzz that your lender or your realtor is trying to steer you in a wrong direction or not giving you that right attention, you know, you can always file a complaint and, you know, move on from there. Um, it's important that we do that because the industry needs to know. Um, the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, consumerfinance.gov, is a wealth of information on every financial topic. Um, probably up there with the Morgan Franklin Fellowship website, I assume. Um, but again, just a great place and somewhere where you can file certain complaints. And then also hud.gov slash complaint. Um, that is the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Those are... HUD actually certifies our organization. Um, they actually certified our housing counselors. So myself, all our counselors did have to take a test um, to become HUD certified. And then these are all the other laws that you're protected under. Um, you know, again, I'm not gonna go into all of them, but I just want you to see that there are laws um, and they're meant to protect you. They're meant to make sure that you're working with licensed professionals. You're not discriminated against for any reason. Um, and then that also this, a lot of these protections helped get rid of what we used to call those subprime loans, uh, which were terrible and got people into a lot of trouble. So why is one-on-one -on -one coaching beneficial to me? So what our counselors will do, um, they'll review personal issues with you, like your credit history, your employment, and your savings history to see what any obstacles might be before you even go out to that lender or realtor. You should always be prepared before you start getting your hopes up and looking at loans. You don't want every lender pulling your credit yet. When we pull it, it's for counseling, so it does not hurt your score. But one of the things on credit is inquiries. So if you have, if you go to the mall and try to open a credit card at 10 different stores, um, that's going to hurt your score because it's, it's credit. However, when you go to buy a house and you go to fill out um, an, uh, a mortgage application, Typically, you're going to have a two-week window um, that you sh you can go shop around with all of them. Every credit report pulled for a mortgage at that point would only count as one because um, you do need the right to be able to shop around. So the council is going to help you set up an action plan that's specific to you to address the hurdles of becoming a homeowner. Um, sometimes those action plans are, hey, here you go. Here's a list of referrals. Go see lenders. You're all set. Or it might be, okay, we need to work on paying off debt. We need to help build credit, whatever the issue is. And then we will continue. So some people come in after a class, they take one counseling session, which we are still doing um, hot and heavy. We've, we've got more people than we ever did when we were doing them in person, but we're doing them through phone and Zoom. Um, and that counselor, we will work with you until you are ready to buy. So we have folks that we've worked with for a couple of years. Um, and again, we have folks that come in once and then you know we don't see them again until they close on their house. But we don't wanna send you out in the world until what we say we call more, your mortgage ready. Um, Council is also gonna review eligibility for different assistance and loan programs. So there are, some, there are some programs in the state 
that have um, down payment assistance and closing cost assistance loans um, that could be helpful. And we also are aware because of our being a nonprofit and all the lenders and banks that were that support us, they're constantly telling us about their loan programs. So we do have a good knowledge of what what is available out there in the industry, especially for a first time home buyer. Um, we will give you referrals to local housing professionals. So you saw that big list of people, a lot of them are on that list. We do not steer you to one or the other. Um, we'll give you the list and tell you, here you go. We have to give you by law, at least two to three referrals um, for any type of service you're looking for. And then you need to make the decisions, but we'll be there to guide you if you have questions. So you can always call on that counselor, like I said, who, ha who has no skin in the game, whether you buy a house or not, you call them. There's only one qualification for the one-on-one -on -one counseling. You must be a graduate of our home buyer seminar. So that's all we require is we want you to get that education first. So your counseling session can be geared to you as opposed to training you all about the different issues of home ownership. And today's session is a very brief um, overview of everything involved. But again, if you take that online class, um, then we don't have to spend as much time teaching you everything as opposed to just working on your specific issues. And that's gonna be more important to you. Um, so some resources, hometeamnh.org is our, um, our website. And if you go into our website, you'll see there's a tab for um, home buyers. And then there's another drop down menu for online courses. And we have two different options. Um, both are the same price, both are $75. Um, one of them has a coupon code to make it 75. So you can choose either option. They're both good um, and they're both certified. So a lot of home, home buyer programs require you to have some sort of home buyer education certificate. Um, typically they want a HUD certified one, which is what ours um, provides. New Hampshire Housing Finance Authority or go newhampshirehousing.com. They have some great programs for all home buyers, you don't necessarily have to be a first time home buyer, and they offer cash assistance programs for people earning less than $135,500 annually. So that's a pretty generous um, income limit to be able to get yourself maybe two, three, four percent of the loan amount to help you with down payment closing costs. Um, and they also have some great more affordable mortgage products. They also have something that we'll teach you that we teach you about. It's called the mortgage credit certificate. You pay a little bit of money, um, but what it does is it basically allows you to take a, a, a credit on your tax return every year for as long as you have that mortgage. So you might pay $500 up front, but over the first year, you're gonna make that up in your taxes. And again, something I highly recommend you go to the GoNewHampshireHousing.com website. They have a whole video on the mortgage credit certificate you can watch to understand it better. And they have all kinds of resources um, on their products and their um, approved loan officers. And then again, the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, consumerfinance.gov has a whole thing of tools on mortgages. So how to reach us. Um, there's our phone number, there's our email. Um, we are located, our main office is located here in Manchester at Elm Street. Of course, we're not seeing people in person, um, but typically we do have offices in Nashua, Manchester, Concord and Laconia. And we also typically in a different environment offered one of them offered um, in-person classes. You can also follow us on social media. Um, I will be honest, I'm not that active on it, but I do try to post occasionally. Um, so please check out, you know, Facebook and Twitter. So when you are going on our website, this is what it's going to look like. And if you look at the top tab, you'll see four home buyers. When you select the drop down, that's where you're going to see online. And there's a whole bunch. We do have some mortgage calculators on here. Um, and a whole bunch of other information that you can feel free to look at. How does someone start the pre-approval process? Well, that's an easy one. You start by going for education and counseling um, and really do the work to determine what you can afford. Before you go to a lender and just give them carte blanche to your finances and have them tell you what you qualify for, like I said in the beginning, you might qualify for a $300,000 mortgage, but truly, you can only afford maybe a $200,000 mortgage. So the lenders only look at your bank statements and your credit, your credit report. They're not looking to see if 
you know, if you do have a coffee habit, um, if you're spending $200 a month on coffee, they're not looking to see if maybe um, you have children that are, you know, in sports programs and, and you're paying for those types of things, which we know those are very expensive. Um, so they're, they're not seeing, you know, do you have a shoe habit? Um, do you buy shoes too much? So things like that, they're not going to see, of course, unless you use your credit cards. Um, but again, once you finish, that's when you go and we'll give you, a, we'll gladly give you a list of referrals. Sometimes I always, I usually tell people, see who your friends and family used. Um, when somebody gives you a referral outside of us um, to a professional, I always stress to people, ask them why they're referring it. Um, they're referring that person. Sometimes I've seen people refer a professional that they didn't even like working with. So all of a sudden, you know, two years later, all they know is, you know, they got in the house, they forgot all the bad stuff. And this, they tell their friends, oh, this is, the, this is the mortgage person I worked with. They don't, you know, I always say, ask them why. Were they good? Were they attentive? Could you understand them? Um, and once, there's a big misconception too, that once you go for that pre-approval, that you have to use that lender when you find the house. That is a total misconception. You can go to any lender you want. Um, just, just because they pulled credit doesn't tie you to them. Um, so keep that in mind. Until you start paying for uh, an appraisal, that's once you start putting money into it, yeah, then if you decide to switch, you might lose some money. Um, but up front, you can go to as many lenders as you want. Um, just be cautious of doing it in the right time frame. And I also caution people, don't shop just for the rate. Um, cause everybody's rate might be a quarter percent difference, you know, so you go down the street, they're a quarter higher, they're a quarter lower, but the one that's lower could have 2000 extra in closing costs. So you want to be mindful of that. It's not just rate. Um, there's going to be costs, there's going to be service involved. And then, um, how do you know what lenders to approach? Well, again, interview them, you know, if, and if they're, if they're chopping at the bit just to pull your credit, you know, Eh, ask them why. Maybe you just, you know, I always tell people, especially with realtors too, um, date them. Ask them, you know, these folks are salespeople. They want your business. They'll buy you a coffee. Or they might buy you breakfast or lunch. Um, you know, tell them up front. I, this is what I'm thinking of doing. I want to talk to you and see if we're going to be able to work together. If, you know, if you're looking, working with a realtor, you want to be cautious about how long of a contract you sign. Because if you say, I'm going to work with you for six months, but you never really knew much about the person. All of a sudden, after the first three houses, you just don't like them. You're not connecting. They're showing you the wrong houses. Well, you're tied to that realtor contract that you signed for six months, unless they let you out of it. So you want to really be cautious about who you're working with and, and get to know the person. Ask questions. Um, Google is my best friend now, and we can all be found on there somehow. So look them up. Look up their reviews. All right. Well, thank you, Paul, so much for giving us this wonderful presentation. Um, always very useful information for all of us, I believe. It's and a challenge to get all of that out in, in such a short time. And I, I, I could sit here for hours and hours and, you know, please, I mean, share my contact information. Um, if people do want to reach out with, with additional questions or more specific questions to their, you know, um, their life that, you know, they might not want to share publicly, I'm happy to work with them on that. Um, you know, it's, it's, again, we just want to create sustainable, successful homeowners. And, you know, and those of you folks who are living out of state, um, I'd highly recommend, so we are part of a major network called NeighborWorks America, who has over 260 charter members throughout the country, um, including Alaska, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico. Um, so we're everywhere. So I know there was someone in Illinois, someone in Massachusetts. Um, you can go onto NeighborWorks America or it's nw.org. And there is a way that you can look at other organizations like ourselves that provide the same service throughout the country. So you may be able to find a similar one in Illinois or Matt. And I know in Massachusetts, um, there, there's several NeighborWorks organizations that provide HUD certified education and counseling. So definitely don't, don't waste your time um, doing it on your own. That's, you know, we found out through the whole foreclosure crisis that people didn't realize we existed until they were in trouble. Um, and they all started sending their kids to us before they bought a house. Um, I will tell you my, just a quick story. My, since you guys don't have a lot of questions, uh, my 28 year old nephew 
um, sent me a text the other day saying, hey, Uncle Paul, me and my buddy are looking at buying this house together. Well, my first advice was don't buy with a buddy. Um, I, I, I first asked if they were sleeping together because I'm like, okay, if you're sleeping together, you're married, you have a relationship, it's a sibling, it's a family member. Okay, you're tied together. But just buying, it's, it's different than renting with a buddy when you're buying, you're stuck together. And if that person decides to move out in the next five years, you're stuck with that entire payment. Um, not to mention the fact he was, they were pipe dreaming and they were looking at a two bedroom, single family house for $825,000. I don't know a lot of people that can buy an $825,000 house, especially a couple of 28 year olds um, with hundreds of dollars in student loan debt. So, you know, I, I was glad he reached out to me. He knows what I do for a living. He knows I'm a former banker, um, but I really, I gave him an earful. Um, and it wasn't as pleasant as this conversation, but, but I just, I wanted to make sure he was smart enough to realize, and he's a college educated um, master's degree that knew nothing about home finance. Nobody teaches home buying in any high school or college class that I know of. And I really wish they would. Um, it's not as difficult. I've been in the business for years. So yes, to me, it's second nature. But I do think people could learn a lot. And that's why I say, you know, don't skimp out, take the home buyer education class, you know, learn, learn what, what you should know. Um, and I always tell, you know, we have people, oh, my friends are realtor, I know everything. You don't know what you don't know. And that's when you find out what you don't know is when you take a class and you participate in counseling. Great, thank you so much, Paul. And, and uh, thank you very much for your presentation and thank you everybody for joining us. Um, we're just going to close with a, a few things about MFF. So our Standards of Financial Literacy program is our signature program, and we provide the necessary foundation for future learning. This program supports the concept of financial freedom through teaching participants how to save by paying themselves first, invest for their future, and grow their net worth. And then after completing our six module course participants can become an MFF fellow. And then once you become an MFF fellow, this is the ticket to access additional MFF courses and opportunities for mentoring, networking, internships, hands-on projects, all sorts of things. Those are the internships and opportunities that allow our fellows to continue their journey to personal financial success. So uh, stay tuned for more uh, recorded learning opportunities from us and we'll be sure to send all this information out about Paul. And thank you very much for joining us today.